Attributes aren't the only way to do validation. Along with data annotations, .NET 4 brought us the iValidatable object interface, which lets us build type-level validation rules. iValidatable object has only one member, and that's the validate method. Beginning with MVC3, iValidatable object was honored by MVC3's validation API, and Entity Framework's validation API will also check any iValidatable object. Here's a bit of code showing the Twitter alias class implementing the interface along with the validate method. I've got one simple rule in there checking to see if the name matches the email address. If they do, that's bad, and so the method returns a validation result. Let's see how this works with the automagic save changes validation before we really dig in to see what's going on. I've modified my insert new alias method a little bit. I've got rid of the second alias that I was adding earlier, and I've changed the name of the alias that I'm adding so that it does match the email. So I'm intentionally making the alias invalid so I can teach you how to use this stuff. So I'll go ahead and run this. And surprise, surprise, there's an exception. I also want to point out that I changed the exception handler to specifically look for a DB entity validation exception. So we'll look at this DB entity validation exception in the quick watch, and I can see that I have one item inside of my entity validation errors, DB entity validation result, like we saw before, and that has two validation errors. Well, it's funny because I only made one problem, which is that I made the mail and the name match each other. I don't remember making two problems. So let's take a look at what the different validation errors are. The first one says alias name cannot match email, and it says that the property that has the problem is name. The second is the same error. Alias name cannot match email, but this time the property name is email. Let me show you why that is. If I look back at the domain class into the validate method, notice that when I built this validation result, I gave it not only the error message that I want to be displayed, but a list of the properties that the error is associated with. This is literally the property names. And the reason those property names are there is because if I'm going to be taking advantage of one of the frameworks that does client-side validation like MVC, then MVC is going to read this validation result and know to apply the error message next to where the name property is displayed and where the email property is displayed. So what's happening here is I'm really getting great value out of these validation APIs because I have one way of defining rules, but then these rules can be checked and leveraged by these various frameworks. So with MVC, if I'm using client-side validation, then the validation rules will be handled in one particular way. Also, the client-side validation for MVC does the same with the attributes. So if, if the username was bad, then it will take the error message for the username and place it on the UI next to the username property. So you can learn a lot more about how the validation interacts with MVC in the various MVC courses on Pluralsight. So I'm not going to focus too much on that. I just want to make sure you understand that it's the same validations that we're using that are being shared by these different mechanisms. So you want to use it on the client side, you can, or if you want to use it in the business layer, you can, or with Entity Framework, I want to do these validations in the data layer for my application.